Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our study of the Gospel of John. I'm glad you could come back. Uh, last week, we spent some time exploring the wedding at Cana. Uh, this was an event that was full of theological significance, um, lessons to walk in faith, uh, information about uh, one of Jesus' earliest recorded uh, miracles, and uh, really a story packed with a lot more uh, interesting stuff to cover than I, to be honest, really thought there would be. Um, so it's definitely worth going back and reading about yourself. This week we're going to take a look at the scene often referred to as the cleansing of the temple or the overturning of the tables of the money changers. The episode is found in chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Uh, if you watch the video introducing the gospel, or this gospel rather, you may remember that one of the issues with this gospel is that some events differ in chronological order uh, versus what is found in the synoptic gospels. Uh, and this is actually one such event. There are a, var a variety of reasons the story may appear so early as opposed to happening late in the other gospels. Um, it is possible there was more than one such occasion. I think it's entirely reasonable uh, to think that this practice was not an isolated one. But really, I think the placement of the story early for John and late for the rest of the Gospel writers is fairly inconsequential. Um, John, even more than the other Gospel writers, really doesn't seem to lay claim to a chronological timeline. It just doesn't seem as important to him. Uh, he's far more interested in the story itself and what it tells us about Jesus. And the details of the story outside of the chronological difference are not different. So without further delay, let us begin. We'll start with chapter 2, uh, verses 13 through 17. And John writes, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So here we find Jesus in Jerusalem for the Passover. And if we do accept John's chronology at face value, then this would be the first Passover of Jesus' ministry. You know, but as I mentioned above, I don't think we should read too much into the timelines with John. What he finds upon entering the temple grounds infuriates him. It makes him mad. Here he sees the money changers selling animals and exchanging Roman coins so that worshippers are able to proceed into the temple area uh, proper to make their sacrifices to atone for their sins. But I think what we can read into this is the idea that these vendors are really turning their trade into more of a form of extortion. I think they're likely taking advantage of the people and not only turning a holy place into a place of business, which is bad enough, but they're using the devotion of the faithful to turn a profit. Um, and I think I think we can read into it that it's at more of an, an extortionist style, um, not a fair profit, is kind of the idea here. And I think this is something uh, most people of faith even today would be repelled by, and rightly so. And it is sadly something that I think happens today in a variety of churches. In an example from about 500 years ago, we see this problem in the Catholic Church. Now, I have no desire to rag on Catholicism or any ca of my Catholic friends by any means, um, but it is an unfortunate truth that any large establishment is prone to corruption, and the Catholic Church has had its um, share of those, one of which was the selling of indulgences. Um, it's one of the very things Luther himself tried to correct with within Catholicism before he started his Protestant Reformation. He never actually wanted to leave Catholicism, he just didn't like the corruption. And he had some other issues too, that's not it. But Now through the selling of indulgences, perhaps akin to the selling of animals at exorbitant prices, the powers that existed were putting a price on salvation. And I think we see this too in churches that preach things like the prosperity or the health and wealth gospel. They promise if you give money, you'll receive God's favor. And that's not what God is about. And this is also part of the reason we see the religious establishment of the time go after Jesus the way they did, I think. Such a system gives power to the few in charge. Jesus represents a change to this paradigm. 
By bringing the new covenant, the practice of animal sacrifice is no longer required. Jesus has become that perfect sacrifice in place of the animals these folks would have purchased or bought or brought from their own farms. By replacing this profitable practice, Jesus threatens the power structure of the church leaders at the time. And again, this wasn't the only way he threatened it, but it was a significant way. So now let's look at verses 18 through 22. The Gospel writer writes, So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So let's talk about a little bit of history here for a minute. As it'll help you know, kind of understand the boldness of the claim that Jesus appears to be making. Construction on the temple uh, in Jerusalem is documented to be to have begun during the reign of King Herod, which ended shortly after the birth of Christ. So roughly 30 years minimum of construction had taken place at that point. Of course, I think in the scripture it said, uh, let me look at it here. Uh, well, it's uh, 46 years, it says, that it took up to that point uh, to build it. And we also know that construction actually wouldn't finish for about another 37 years, with the temple being completed in 63 AD. The completed temple would only stand for seven years when it was destroyed by the armies of Titus. So given the length of time the initial construction took, it really is kind of a laughable claim that Jesus will rebuild it in only three days. And it would have appeared so to those who, who heard this claim who didn't understand what he was, and of course didn't understand what he was talking about. But in retrospect, John notes that what Jesus said made perfect sense, as he was not speaking of the building, but of his own body. We know that Jesus was tortured, broken, and executed, and that he rose three days later, reborn, and remade in the resurrection. You see, not only is Jesus replacing the practice of animal sacrifice, he is replacing the entirety of the temple structure, and with it the hierarchy the power structure that it maintained. He's reforming an entire religion. He is cutting out the middleman. As the tabernacle incarnate, he is saying the sinner may now come directly to him and by faith alone be saved from their sins. No payment is required, only faith. And this brings me to what I think is an interesting point. It may not be one everyone agrees with. And as such, I feel it necessary to point out that in the American Baptist tradition, we practice our faith in a way that allows for a liberality of views and understandings of Scripture. As such, one should not take my opinions as anything other than my own best understanding of Scripture and not any official viewpoint. Okay, that's enough disclaimers. Now to my point. It's always seemed a little strange to me that we think of Judaism and Christianity as two different and disparate religions. Because in truth, Christianity is actually, or seems to me at least, to be the continuation of Judaism. By becoming Christians, we don't simply disavow the Old Testament or the books of it that would make up the Torah. We don't lose the teachings of Moses or David or Solomon or anyone or anyone else. We simply understand that a new way of relating to God has come. We as Christians understand that Christ has come as the sacrificial lamb and that the dynamic of our relationship with God has been forever changed. Jesus did not come to end the practice of his Jewish brethren. Rather, he came to bring it to the next step as prophesied in the Old Testament. Anyway, that's my take on this section of John's Gospel. I hope you'll join us for the next video as we continue exploring this part of the good news. Uh, in the next one, we are going to look at chapter 3 and cover what I think is a very interesting discussion between Jesus and the Pharisee Nicodemus. I hope you'll join us for that soon. Take care.